housing policy. Uh, a health and housing policy analyst here in the homeless services section of Oregon Housing and Community Services. Today, we're really pleased to welcome Katie Miller, who is a senior regional advisor from the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, and she'll be or she'll be sharing an overview of all in the federal strategic plan to end homelessness. And before we jump into content today, I would like to do just a, a few quick housekeeping notes. Um, we also have today with us Brittany Manzo, who is a, a policy consultant with experience working at USICH, as well as in-depth experience working within Oregon. And Brittany will be helping moderate today. And then Beth Byrne from Oregon Housing and Community Services Public Affairs team is also here to support the presentation. Um, there will be an opportunity at the end to ask questions. Um, and then we will also be monitor monitoring the chat if you have clarifying questions while Katie is speaking. Um, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge the particular moment we are in as Oregonians who are working to end homelessness. Many of you are familiar with recent data showing that Oregon ranked in the top five of states with the highest percentage of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness. We have the highest percentage of families with children who are unsheltered. From 2007 to 2022, we had over a 40% increase in homelessness. And we recorded the second largest increase in the number of veterans experiencing homelessness. And we know that these impacts are disproportionately felt by communities of color. These numbers are sobering and concerning. And at the same time, I suspect that they weren't that surprising to people who are working directly with folks experiencing homelessness in your communities. Many of you have been working very hard for years without all the tools you need to make the scale of impact necessary to turn these numbers around. And that's why it feels encouraging to me in this moment that our new governor has made homelessness such a priority in her administration and is backing it with investment and coordination to offer meaningful pathways out of houselessness for more Oregonians. So today, Katie will offer some insight tools and best practices from the federal plan to end homelessness to take back to your organizations and communities as we all work together to improve housing access and stability for unhoused and unstably housed neighbors. And let me check if Katie, I think we're still unfortunately unable to see Katie, but I think we'll still be able to hear her. So Katie, if you're ready with that, I will hand that over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Liz. I am so sorry, everyone, that you're not able to see me. I um, have tried multiple times, and for some reason, it's just not working. Um, so um, I hope to be able to see you at another time and, and connect um, face to face, but I do wanna share this really important information. Um, at USICH, um, we are so excited to re release this new federal strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness. Um, this is not uh, the first federal plan that we have released, but it builds on all of the plans to date. Um, many things have happened in our community um, and um, we see each plan that comes out as building on the successes and the lessons learned from plans that came out previously. Um, in 2021, um, we hosted many listening sessions to get input on this new federal plan. Um, we really wanted to hold a very comprehensive process um, for getting and hearing um, getting information and hearing from the community about what um, the greatest needs are on the ground. And so we held 80 listening sessions. We received more than um, 1,500 public comments, and we heard from over 500 people with lived experience of homelessness. Next slide.
This goes through a lot of that. Also, um, we um, worked very closely with the 19 member agencies of the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness to get their feedback and buy-in on the plan. And I, I should go back to say, um, if you're not familiar with USICH, USICH's job is to coordinate the federal response to homelessness across 19 federal agencies. Um, that includes HUD and HHS and VA and labor all the way to the post office. So this federal plan is critical to help um, guide federal agencies as they do work as it touches on or relates to preventing and ending homelessness. Uh, next slide. So while we heard a lot of things um, when speaking to communities, um, there were a number of things that were um, that really came out that were the biggest challenges that you all are facing on the ground. And some of those are, are very obvious. The lack of um, housing supply, the rising rent with slow income growth, inadequate access to support services, unsheltered homelessness that is rising in communities, and the criminalization of homelessness. Also, um, the incredible fatigue and trauma among providers and just um, the difficulty in hiring enough staff to support programs right now. Um, through the pandemic, it was very, very challenging for community-based organizations and people doing the work on the ground. Next slide. The other thing though we heard was some great opportunities. Um, we, with unprecedented amounts of federal resources coming out through the American Rescue Plan, the CARES Act, uh, the president's um, 2023 budget. Um, we also saw a lot of commitment, the housing supply action plan, the now national mental health strategy, the national drug control strategy, and other executive orders. Uh, we learned a great deal from um, the pandemic and um, the work that we did over the last couple of years around creating non-congregate shelter and um, shifting how um, empty or unused hotel and motels were used emergency rental assistance, getting that out very quickly in communities, the eviction moratorium, and also cash, direct cash to people who are most vulnerable. Um, there's also a, an increased focus on racial equity. Um, the administration has um, created several executive orders related to racial equity, and then the opportunity um, for greater accountability and more equitable outcomes at the federal level. There's also unwavering dedication, a lot of um, passionate and compassionate people like you doing the incredible work on the ground. And we continue to, to move forward and work together as a team. Next slide. So All In um, really represents um, an all of government approach um, to addressing homelessness um, it is a multi-year federal plan. It really serves as a roadmap um, for federal action. To, and it also is a hope that it will be used as a guide to help ensure that state and local communities um, have sufficient resources, policy guidance, and the tools to build effective and sustainable systems, um, both to prevent and <clears throat> in homelessness. We find that when Everything is working well. We have clear alignment at the local, the state, and the federal level. And um, our hope is that this is driving the work at the federal level. But as communities begin to dig into this plan, we hope that you'll find that there are pieces that work for your community. And I can work with you and others can work with you to help um, make sure that this is aligned to your work. It does not, it's not a linear plan. It's not a plan that we expect you to take page one and do page two and um, it really is um, take the pieces of it that fit to the work that you're doing now, and then um, let's work together to design and implement the strategies um, that make the most sense to where your community is currently um, focused on. Next slide. Um, the vision for the future, um, something that is was really um, surprising and exciting that came from this process with our federal partners is that uh, there is a commitment to reduce homelessness by 25% by the year 2025. This is a very, very bold goal. And it this work really must be carried at the local level with, uh, with the idea that the federal government will work very hard to be sure that the resources and tools are available to communities. 
Um, it, and achieving this goal really requires all of us. It can't be done by one system or sector alone. Next slide. Um, one thing that you'll find um, in this um, plan is that we do not really focus on specific subpopulations. So in other federal plans, you might have read um, maybe about ending veteran homelessness by a certain date or ending chronic homelessness or youth or family homelessness. Um, what we really wanna do here is focus on all populations because what we recognized and learned from those previous plans is while the federal government might've been focused on veteran or chronic homelessness, a specific community may have been focused on family and youth homelessness, and it might have been confused um, and it provided confused messaging when I'm um, trying to drive local efforts and investments when it wasn't necessarily timed well with the federal government. And so what we're saying now is this really is driven by you. What are the populations and focus areas that you want to, um, based on your data, focus on? And we want to support that. And then um, we will be working to set a framework um, to reduce homelessness for all populations. And so really looking at a more universal target um, to help communities get there and to help us get to that goal. Um, next slide. So um, All In focuses, um, it's really built around six pillars. There are three foundation pillars, which are equity, evidence, and collaboration. And then there are three as uh, solutions pillars, which is housing and supports, um, homelessness response, and prevention. Um, across these pillars, there are 30 strategies and 180 actions that the fe federal government will pursue to facilitate increased access to housing, economic security, and health and stability. Next slide. So I want to start um, just generally looking at these pillars, and this is something obviously we can we can dig more into um, later, and I hope that you'll take some time and read the plan. Um, but um, under the first um, of the foundational pillars, um, re lead with equity. Um, as Liz mentioned earlier, the impacts of systemic racism and discrimination have resulted in some groups, especially people of color and people with disabilities and LGBTQ populations being disproportionately impacted with homelessness. Black Americans especially are overrepresented, over, oh, excuse me, overrepresented at a rate of three to one compared to the general population. So we have to build an efficient and effective response to homelessness, and um, this is going to require intentional action. So strategies within this pillar will focus on ensuring that the federal efforts to prevent and end homelessness promote, promote equity and inclusive and authentic collaboration for decision making. We want to examine and modify the policies and requirements that have intentionally or unintentionally created and perpetuated racial and other dis um, disparities. An example of this type of action in this pillar might be examining the barriers to compensating people with lived experience for their work and coordinating a federal TA strategy to support tribes and native serving organizations. Um, we will also um, use data and evidence to inform decision-making and policy development. This will involve strengthening the federal government's capacity to collect and use and share data. We must provide guidance and resources to help build capacity of state and local governments, tribes, native serving organizations, and nonprofits. We want to invest in innovation and build upon research and evidence of what works. Examples of actions to pursue Pursue within this pillar include um, issuing guidance on real and perceived barriers to sharing federal data at state and local levels and developing a federal research agenda. So this is under the data and um, evidence pillar. The last of our foundation pillars is collaborating at all levels. Ending homelessness will take all of us um, with the title all in. Every level of government, public and private organizations, philanthropy, faith-based organizations, and all sectors. We must work outside of the silos that are often created, and um, we have to work towards a shared and common goal. Examples of actions that we'll pursue under this pillar include 
launching coordinated messaging campaigns to combat harmful narratives and launching more place-based cross-agency technical assistance strategies. Next slide. In the solutions pillar, um, these really go hand in hand um, with the foundation pillars. So we need to um, scale housing and supports. Um, we know that people are most successful when the housing and the support services are directly linked and accessible to people. A true housing first model requires that we scale up both housing and supports to create systems where all people, no matter how complex the needs are, can thrive. And so uh, this pillar focuses on strategies and actions to increase the supply of housing, maximize the use of existing housing assistance, and increase and strengthen system capacity to address the needs of people with disabilities, including mental health conditions, substance use disorders, and providing and promoting practices grounded in evidence, um, such as harm reduction. An example of actions to pursue within this pillar include aligning eligibility criteria across federal programs and investing in peer-led housing and service delivery models. Under the next, um, the next pillar here under solutions pillars is um, the homeless response system. Um, we have to do more um, to improve the effectiveness and outcomes. Um, there will soon be announced an all of government effort being developed to address unsheltered homelessness. Um, communities across the country and especially in the West are really struggling with unsheltered homelessness. And we're working across the federal government to create um, tools and more support for communities around unsheltered homelessness in particular. Um, we have to look at policies related to coordinated entry and fair housing and fix what has not been working and strengthen those things that have. Um, the last pillar is on preventing homelessness. And this is a pillar where we may get the most questions. Uh, and so I wanna clarify what we mean by prevention in this case. So um, we often talk about eviction prevention or prevention at the shelter door. We have some incredible models around diversion and eviction prevention, and especially the work that's been done over the last um, few years to get rental assistance out to folks to help um, prevent um, a mortgage default or to prevent someone from losing their home in an eviction. So um, in this case, um, we are talking higher upstream. So for the first time ever, um, we are really pushing on federal systems of care to prevent the inflow of homelessness as people transition from these systems. And we know um, from data that um, as someone transitions out of a jail or out of the military or out of hospitals um, or out of um, foster care, that those transitions cause um, a lot of stress in a person's life. And the risk of them becoming homeless at that time is much greater. And so we are looking at these systems of care and really wanting to prevent homelessness. As we began to set targets and goals um, under this new plan, um, while we were just really aware that we had to turn both wheels at the same time. In the past, we've been afraid to touch um, the work of upstream prevention because we didn't want to avert, divert attention or resources array, away from the immediate crisis of homelessness. And But we now know we have to do both. So um, while the work that you all are doing and the work that is being done around the country right now is incredible. We house approximately 900,000 people every year that exit homelessness, but 930,000 people fall into homelessness every year. So unless we address the upstream inflow of homelessness, we aren't going to get anywhere. And that is, again, with um, the incredible programs, the incredible investments that we currently have in place. And so this is where this new um, pillar is going to come into place as we, again, really outline for all of the federal agencies um, their role in preventing homelessness. And then um, implementing all in, next slide. 
Um, we will be um, developing implementation plans uh, with specific actions and milestones and metrics. As Britt Manzo knows, she was very involved um, with this on our policy team when she was with USICH. We have interagency working groups with each of the federal agencies where um, we set um, goals within these federal agencies and, and, and work out the specific, again, metrics and milestones. Um, and then we will be partnering with communities and people with lived experience to solicit feedback all along the way. And then we will be publishing annual performance uh, management plan updates and um, updating this plan um, annually based on the input and the work done um, as, as we implement it. Next slide. So we will, sorry, my dog is barking in the background. I'm sorry if, if you can hear that. Um, we will be measuring progress um, based on the overall size of homelessness. Um, people, including subpopulations, experiencing sheltered and unsheltered homelessness, racial disparities in homelessness, children and youth experiencing homelessness during the school year, the length of time homeless, returns to homelessness, and um, people um, who become homeless for the first time, and then the placement and the retention of housing from street outreach. Um, what's really important about um, the measurement piece, I think often we talk about using um, the point in time count. We are very clear that the point in time count does not give us all of the information that we need to fully measure and understand homelessness and the needs. Um, and so we will be. Um, looking at many different data sets um, within um, our ability, you know, within the federal agencies um, to understand and, um, and, and talk about uh, the numbers better. Next slide. Maybe before you go to the next slide, um, there's a question in the chat about whether the federal plan uh, identifies any goals around uh, housing development. So the question is, with the goal of decreasing homelessness by 25%, does this plan share more information about housing development? Specifically, is the goal to build more affordable housing development versus mixed income housing? And what feels like more of a priority? Um, if given the opportunity for local jurisdictions to develop housing with properties they own, what feels like their focus should be on this on the type of housing they develop? That's a really great question. We know that it's gonna take all of it. So we cannot build our way out of this. We have to look at all of the options. So we are seeing some incredible innovation in communities around, again, purchasing old hotels and motels. We're seeing some incredible modular construction where um, people are able to um, cut the timelines for um, building. Um, but we, I, it really is going to take uh, a range of options and it's a range of solutions, um, community by community and um, population by population. I hope that helps. Thank you. So finally, I really want to talk about how the plan can be used locally. I understand, um, you know, it covers a lot of information. Um, there are a lot of pieces, but again, what we're really hoping is um, that while this is really focused on driving the work of the federal government, that there are pieces of it that you can leverage based on um, the current climate and the work that you're doing locally. And so I'd love um, to have continued conversations with you about how we can do this and um, what pieces of the plan you might want to dig into and, um, and the work that we can do best at the federal level to support your local action. And that's really all I have. I'd love to open it up for questions. Great, we have a first straightforward question for you. Um, and it, will you make the slides available? Um, sure, I'd be happy Thank to. You. <laughs> and, um, Liz, I think you have the slide deck. Um, so you're okay. welcome to send that out. Okay. That is totally fine. Um, 
Great, so we will make both the recording and the slides available on our end. Um, and then there's a next question in the chat here. Uh, one concern I have is the need for Section 8 to actually have price parameters that are based on, on not just the median of statewide pricing, but actually based on the median of available and open units per uh, in the county that the client resides. Uh, I'm having scrolling issues. <laughs> Right now, the assistance is at $9.95 for a one bedroom for one person when the median rent in Jackson County is actually $12.50 for one person in one bedroom. Absolutely. That's, uh, that is an issue. It's an issue in a number of communities and it's technical. A lot of it depends on um, how it's set at the, at, with your local housing authority. And so I, my question back would be, have you had this discussion with HUD um, with your local field office and your local housing authority to figure out if that can be adjusted. Um, in some cases it can be, and I'm not an expert, um, but there are some ways um, to look at that, but it does impact then the number of vouchers you have access to. Other questions. Do you expect more funding from Congress for homeless services? If not, how will federal agencies shift existing funding to make a bigger impact? That is a great question. We absolutely want uh, more investment from Congress. Unfortunately, we can't control that um, as a federal agency, but our asks are bold to Congress and, um, and the administration is showing um, very bold ass as well as it relates to homelessness. There is a lot of um, focus on both affordable housing and on addressing the issues of, un of homelessness. Um, I think along a similar vein, um, will federal money be available to do hotels to housing? Uh, when and will P, uh, PBV be in tandem? Um, that's a question, a great question. I am not sure what additional resources will come out. Um, I think, you know, many communities have used um, federal money to help with the purchase of hotels, and then they've also leveraged um, state resources and other local dollars. And so I, um, I am not sure what additional resources are going to come um, in the future. Thank you. And I think someone also is adding to the chat that this is definitely a topic of interest and in that there was some recommendation to go to our state representatives to talk about that as an option um, that providers would like to have. We do know in some states where um, the state prioritized this, um, there was a lot that came from that. So for instance, in the state of California, where the state made a large investment in the purchase of hotels and motels and then the conversion um, to permanent housing later, that, um, that really helped communities to be able to do that. Um, but we've also seen this happening in other states across the country. Yeah, and it certainly, <laughs> I am not the person to go into the details of this for sure, um, but you know, in Oregon, there's been standing up of Project Turnkey sites with partnership with uh, the Oregon Community Foundation and uh, OHCS. And so there are some examples of that happening right now on Project Turnkey 2.0. And so if folks would like more information about that, we can also, also get that out. Um, Couple more questions in the chat. Um, how will the wealth gap be addressed in conjunction with housing? How can we further support folks who have jobs, but they'll not be able to self-sustain after exiting a program despite working full-time? That's a brilliant um, question. And I, you know, again, uh, more to come um, as um, the administration grapples with this. But what I will see, say is that we're seeing in a number of communities that are um, implementing basic 
incomes. Um, so for instance, in um, Denver and uh, cities in California that they are based, um, they are implementing projects where um, universal basic income is available to low income people and people experiencing homelessness um, to help with um, the income disparity. Thank you. This is a question about prevention um, and whether you know if HUD will increase the vouchers for holders to be able to access market rate rentals. Um, due to rising rent costs, many voucher holders in our community are unable to access and utilize housing. I think this is an issue of an affordable affordability coming up in many of the questions here that, that Oregon is, is facing in a big way right now. Yeah, that is really important. Um, the voucher payment standard, um, again, there is a way to talk to your housing authority and to HUD about whether it can be raised based on the market in your community and in the market analysis of your community. That is something that I really recommend you having a conversation with the housing authority about. Sometimes it varies from the type of voucher to the type of voucher. And again, I'm not an expert. Um, but there are communities, especially very high cost communities that have been able to do a market analysis that to change that based on um, their inability to lease up those vouchers. It is very serious. There's another question here. Smaller and rural communities often have less structural capacity and or political will to pursue and utilize funding available at the state and federal levels. Can you share strategies USICH will implement to help local areas overcome the access issue? Um, that's a great question. And I, as your senior regional advisor working with the state of Oregon, I'd love to talk about some of the rural um, needs and issues that you're facing in smaller communities. I'd love to have that conversation and already have in some communities, smaller communities in Oregon. Um, also, we're so excited that um, HUD has just released money that's specific to rural homelessness, um, both unsheltered homelessness and rural homelessness, really recognizing um, that the needs of rural communities um, are sometimes just as great um, or more great than some of the issues happening in urban areas. So while um, we often have more connection with or hear more about um, urban homelessness, what we know is that the actual lack of housing um, and the lack of affordable housing in rural communities makes homelessness so much harder. And the next question in the chat um, is really recognizing the scale of what what folks are facing right now. So if it, the question is, if there's an increase of number of uh, sheltered homeless, while the uh, percent, uh, the number who become homeless increase at a greater rate, how will we ever be able to decrease homelessness by 25%? So I think talking about that 30% or 30,000 uh, person difference between folks exiting homelessness and um, then folks who are newly experiencing homelessness. Yeah, I mean, we just found that we could not um, ignore it any longer. We have to start looking at, um, at, the, at what is happening to people um, and why they're coming into homelessness to begin with. And, you know, it was a real feeling that while we do incredible work when someone comes to the shelter door, but at that point, sometimes it's too late. Um, that we have to start sooner, we have to go upstream and figure out um, what is going on, um, either with the systems or structures or, um, or safety net, what is happening that is causing people to fall into homelessness. And so that work um, had, to, it could not be ignored any longer. Shifting gears a little bit, uh, a question about coordinated access. So will HUD and this plan require all homeless folks be referred to permanent supportive housing and affordable housing through coordinated access? So is there a statement about using coordinated access in this plan or um, through HUD? I don't believe we've made a statement like that, no. 
I think that um, there will be work done with communities on improving coordinated entry and ensuring that coordinated entry works um, well for communities. And I know that it, it can be very bumpy in some communities. It's um, And so I think the hope is that we'll spend a lot more work making sure that these systems actually work efficiently and effectively for people who are experiencing the crisis of homelessness. My next question, will state or federal resources come available to ensure and maintain the sustainability of the physical assets built, rehabbed, converted housing units and maintain ongoing graduated wraparound services to support the individuals housed or served? Um, serving individuals previously experiencing chronic homelessness, managing the properties and maintaining the assets can be very expensive and labor intensive. How will this initiative support this kind of stability? sustainability? Pardon me. Great question. And again, um, the I'm not able to see ahead into the future about what resources, resources will become available, but there is a clear acknowledgement that we must support people not only um, exiting homelessness, but while um, they're in permanent housing and beyond. Um, so we have to create systems that provide low barrier supports and um, that are really linked to housing. And I think there's also an answer at the state level too. I am I'm not with the affordable rental housing section, and maybe we can get some information from those folks to include in what we're sending out to. So I can find you more information from the state level of what we're doing on on that front too. Um, and then going down in the chat, um, Chris, who works at the Housing Authority of Clackamas County, was sharing that um, when they went back to HUD to increase the fair market rents and they were successful at advocating for that. So that's a real time example of, of that actually, your suggestion, Katie, happening. And I, you know, a lot of my experiences in Multnomah County, and I know that from time to time they have been able to increase there too. So um, that is good news that that is a successful strategy. Um, this is, and then the, can I yeah, add the previous yes. question about ongoing supports for people? I'm so excited about the work that Oregon has done around a Medicaid waiver. Again, um, the resources that come um, in other states that have implemented um, the Medicaid waivers that really provide those longer term support services to people who need them um, has just been a game changer. And so I'm excited about um, the work that Oregon has has gone is doing and is jumping into in that regard. That's a that's a, a federal resource that is a much more stable and longer term resource for supports. Yeah, thank you. That, that is one area I've gotten to dig into a, a lot of my time here. And certainly um, if folks are looking for information about that, that is a rapidly evolving um, benefit really trying to figure out how that's going to be administered and expecting that to come online sometime around January 2024. So just if folks aren't familiar with that timeline, that that's what we're looking at for the Medicaid waiver um, housing benefits that, that we now have permission to administer in Oregon. Um, the next question here is oh, about improved rent or approved rent increases. So there's a rise in rental expenses with an Oregon state approval of a 14% rent increase allowed per year. When folks can hardly afford the rent they have, raising the rent so extremely will only likely increase forced relocation and homelessness. What can be done to support lowering these increased amounts? Can we support people to be able to stay in their homes that are above the poverty rate before for the cost of housing puts them in a position of poverty. Uh, yeah, and Liz, I don't know if you wanna answer that for the state of Oregon. Um, there is a concern about this nationally. Um, we are seeing rises um, everywhere and we're very concerned about it. So I, I know that um, we're looking at different um, tenant supports um, to help mitigate this. But as far as what's happening in Oregon, I, I can't speak to that. 
Yeah, and I do think it's a similar uh, landscape. There are adv advocacy groups working really hard on this this issue and are are bringing it up and certainly putting the data before uh, lawmakers about what those those increases mean. Um, so, you know, I think there's there's great work that's happening and. I, as someone who's new to state government, I am not entirely sure what my line is for how I can point you in that direction, but there is really great advocacy work happening there. Um, I am going to go uh, to the next question. Could you provide a source for understanding the 30,000 person difference? I think that's referring to um, outflow and inflow to houselessness. I'm sorry. Um, my, I just had, we are having some technical issues today. Um, so um, the question about the difference between the number of people coming into homelessness every year versus the number exiting, is that, um, can you give me a little bit more information? Yes, this was a question from Phil, uh, John Cock. And if you would like to add more, you're certainly welcome to, but I think they're looking for a source to help understand that 30,000 person difference. Yeah, I mean, as far as a source goes, that was just information as we started looking at data. It's approximate. Um, we were uh, meeting very closely with HUD. Again, we were meeting with our council to figure out what our goal would be. And um, as we kept looking and crunching data and looking at the information, and, and this was data provided by HUD, um, it was just clear that the number of people exiting every year um, was very high, but um, not as high as the number of people entering. And I hope that helps. It's really just to give you an example of, of why we felt that we needed to start looking upstream. Let me take a look and um, let me scroll down for a moment just to make sure there wasn't anything added to that one. Okay, and then I'll go back up. So um, there's a comment that there's a cycle of requiring that folks stay at a certain income level for assistance. So clients are often encouraged to maintain a level of poverty so that they can maintain having assistance. When they go then go back to work, they earn too much money uh, to get help and then also find fall behind on bills. The, the sustainability is unreasonable. Right, that is very concerning. And Robin Smith added, um, just a FYI, tur oh, turnkey 2.0 is finished with applications, but will house 500 people. That is wonderful. To hear. Thank you, Robin, for putting that in the chat. That's great. Um, another comment here, city manager says the city is not in business of providing social services. Suggestions for citizens to get support for local nonprofits doing the work and fighting city hall. I think um, I in my role, I can't tell you how to advocate. And <laughs> in my previous life, I was a very strong advocate. And um, but I think that um, advocacy efforts um, are really important on local voice. I also recognize that the COC can play a very critical role um, in. Um, highlighting data that makes it hard to avoid um, what's going on. There's another addition to the chat here. The wait list for housing programs in Oregon are up to six years. A disabled person waiting for uh, social security disability approval will still have to wait six months for general assistance from Department of Human Services, Social Security, um, and uh, up to three years for disability approval of which uh, the assistance must be paid back. 
general assistance only provides 565 for rent, 90 for utilities, and $60 in cash. There are no rentals available for that amount of money unless they rent a room in a stranger's home. And that requires shared spaces and very likely a need for accommodations or modifications. Yes, yes to all that. The, the gap between the benefits that, that folks are entitled to at a federal level and what is needed to sustain housing in Oregon is great. And especially for, for the population of folks who have social security disability benefits, that, that margin is this teeny, teeny, tiny. Um, Katie, I don't know if you would like to add to that. I just think it's remarkable. I mean, this is coming up a lot, and I think this really speaks to this being a, a critical need and a, a, something for an ongoing conversation around um, the about what's happening with rents in Oregon. Great. Um, there's a there's a comment saying I second that sentiment. The extreme inefficiencies and underfunding in two of the big federal programs, the, the VA and Social Security Administration that are supposed to serve people with significant disabilities have led many into homelessness. And then there was a question above that. Um, there's a strategy in, all in, in the All In Plan to increase access to federal housing and homelessness funding for American Indian and Alaska Native communities living on and off tribal lands. Can you say more about actions to address this strategy? Sure. We are um, really promoting the increase in, um, in resources for tribes. I think that's the best way of putting it. Um, and looking at ways to make sure that that directly, um, that housing um, and those resources go directly to tribes. So that is an ongoing um, body of work that we are taking on. And that's also something, fortunately, I, I, I see is moving at the state level too with Governor Kotek's recommended budget. There was specific funding um, for the nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon in, in that proposed budget. So hopefully we're moving in the same direction at the state level as well. Let me scroll through here. Um, we may be at the end of the, the questions. If there are any additional questions, please put them in the the chat, I've heard a couple things that we would like to follow up on. We will make the recording and the slides available. I will also, with that, um, get out information about Project Turnkey and um, find more details about the 500 folks that, that are slated for um, to be served by Project Turnkey 2.0. Um, also, some more information from our Affordable Rental Housing uh, Division. Is there anything else folks would like to make sure we get in front of our federal partners before we say goodbye to Katie? Oh, we do. People are jumping on it. Awesome. Um, I would like to encourage programs that support people to increase skills and go back to work while in temporary assistance housing programs so they have a better opportunity um, to move towards self-sustainability. For example, work part-time while going to vocational programs and get housing help all simultaneously, and that will help homeless students. That's great. Yes, I agree. Yeah, and I know there are some really interesting um, local programs that are sp specifically looking at houseless students. Um, I, I know some of those are moving forward too. So like, this is one of the things um, where I think there's there's some really good local work that's happening that we can look at um, for models going forward uh, um, across the state. So thank you so much for adding that. And Amanda, how will we get the slides? Will you be emailing them? I am going to uh, ask Beth, our communications person, <laughs> to jump in here and let you know how, how that all works. Yes, we will upload the video and we will share the slides with everybody who attended today through email. 
Thanks, Beth. And Great. Well, I hope that this will not be the last time that I get to visit with you all and, and speak with you. So I hope you'll invite me back. I really, this is really important and really love hearing your feedback and, and you raising the issues that are most important to you right now. Another suggestion for pre-approval programs so the agencies better support each other. I love that call for collaboration and um, support each other and the clients is very near needed. And as we're wrapping up, Brett, I, you've had this great perspective of working both at the federal level and within Oregon. I don't know if you would like to add anything to the chat as we, we wrap up. Yeah, I want to, well, first I want to celebrate Katie and the administration, USICH, getting the plan out. Um, it is a huge improvement on what had been laid out in uh, the prior administration, and I think it offers a ton of inspiration at any level of homeless services, um, or really social services more broadly. If you, if you flip it open, I think you can get some inspiration about how we might do our work differently in a more coordinated, collaborative, integrated way. Um, it's not a roadmap for everyone meeting you exactly where you are, but there's a lot of inspiration in there. And from my seat, um, I, I am able to say that advocacy is absolutely the space um, for, for folks to, to work to make a difference with elected officials. I think in Oregon, the Oregon State Legislature has a lot of say in how the state operates, and they have a lot of office doors that are open to hear about what's working and what's not. What I would also offer is um, that we are experiencing a growing crisis. Oregon is at the forefront. Learn about local policy. Learn about places where you and your friends can get involved, um, because it really is folks who are experts who take the time to understand the issue better, who help local governments change. Um, so they need you alongside them. So that's that's my encouragement for the day. And Katie, thank you so much for the wisdom and, and the vision that you shared from USICH to all of us today. Thanks, Britt. Yes, thank you all so much. Thank you for taking the time today to attend. Like Katie said, I hope this is the first part of a, a continuing conversation with our colleagues at USICH. And Katie, thank you again for taking the time and for, for introducing us to the, the federal plan. And we will be following up with the information that we promised in slides. So I hope everyone has a lovely rest of your day. Thanks so much. Excellent. Thank you so much.